for having me along. Um, so I'm not an Aucklander. Uh, I'm from Wellington. I'm one of those rare creatures who was born and raised and lives in Wellington. I just wanted to acknowledge what an amazing thing it is that you have built. Uh, and if I wasn't a Wellingtonian and I did live here, it would be such a pleasure to use that as my commute into town. I want to acknowledge uh, Ngāti Whātua or Orake, uh, on whose land uh, we stand. Um, Michael Wood, uh, my colleague in Parliament, uh, your local Member of Parliament, um, and uh, an up-and-coming member of the uh, Labour, Labour Caucus and Executive. Uh, Generation Zero, we've got Generation Zero in the House. So I've had a lot to do with Generation Zero uh, over the past uh, several years. Um, but particularly over the course of the past two years when we got into government and picked up their Zero Carbon Bill, which is currently working its way through the House. Um, ngā rangatangi, ngā rangatahi whakaio i te ao, uh, Puka Te Papa Low Carbon Network, the Puka Te Papa Youth Board um, and the International Peace Youth Group uh, who have all been involved in um, putting this day together. And I also want to acknowledge the uh, local um, board members uh, and representatives who are here. Look, I just wanted to say climate change is the reason that I actually got into politics. Uh, I first, I would, I would describe myself when I was younger as a general purpose environmentalist. Um, so I was I, kind of a child of the 80s and I grew up around issues like uh, French nuclear testing in the Pacific, uh, the end of the Cold, check, check, the end of the Cold War, um, uh, the, the kind of whaling um, and and marine mammal issues in the Pacific and so on. Uh, and it was when I uh, got into business, and I was living in London, and I started becoming more and more aware of uh, some of the information, some of the data that was coming through around climate change. And it got to that point where I kind of realized it was the issue that defined all of the other issues. You know, you can save the whales, um, but if your oceans are boiling, there's not a lot you can do, uh, and, and that kind of applies everywhere. Um, but I also realised uh, that, you know, whilst there was some movement in the, in the business community, climate change is one of those things which is going to take all of us, and it's going to take everything that we've got, at every single level. Um, and it, and it, does, it is one of those things that has to involve political change. So we can all do a lot, we can do a lot in our communities and in our families, in our businesses, so on. But if there isn't political change, we're not going to get there. Um, and ultimately that was why I decided to come home and, and uh, run for Parliament. Um, and I'm not here to kind of lecture you about how bad climate change is, right? I mean, you kind of know that already. In the last week you've seen stories about the Arctic being on fire, I mean the Arctic, uh, the Amazon being on fire, you know, you name it. Every, every single day now there's a story. Uh, about, about climate change. But one of the things that we know is that people need more than just the bad news, right? Otherwise you just get this sort of sense of helplessness, that it's all overwhelming, it's too big for me, I can't do anything about it. And I, and I want to talk about what is changing, not because I don't think that things are bad and that we should kind of ignore the bad stuff, because it is bad and it is all out there and it is all happening, but because actually we kind of know that already, and what we need to focus on is what we can do about it. Because it is bad, but we can fix it. Um, Ports of Auckland have made a commitment to be carbon neutral by the year 2040. So they've got 20 years, they've said by the time we get to 2040, we don't want any, you know, we don't want any of our emissions uh, to be counting towards climate change, and if there is anything that we're putting out, we'll offset it. But the more 
that you put out, the more you have to offset. Uh, and so actually they're just talking about trying to make sure that they bring their pollution levels right down. And so when you start to think creatively and you say, actually we're going to draw a line in the sand and we're, you know, we're going to set ourselves a target that by this date we've got to be carbon neutral uh, no matter what it takes. And then you look around and you think, well, what can we do? And you apply that constraint. And it is a big constraint. Actually, that then creates innovation, right? Because it's like, actually, we're forced to. If we just said, oh, we'd like to be carbon neutral by 2040, but it turns out that no one makes electric tugboats and we'll just buy a diesel, then we're, then we're not going to be carbon neutral by 2040, right? And this is just one story of one business uh, with one tug, right? By itself, that's not going to change the world. But it's thinking like that that is going to change the world, and it is changing the world. And so the work that we do when we say, uh, you know, when we set ourselves a target uh, for reducing our emissions or living within the uh, temperature goal is actually really important. And if we're all to apply that, like we're trying to do that through government, through the Zero Carbon Act at the moment, but if we're all to do that, and in fact we are all doing that, but councils, including Auckland Council, setting themselves these eye-watering goals for being carbon neutral by 2040 or 2050, uh, then actually that really spurs kind of action at every level. And that I think is the kind of thing that we can all participate in. We're starting to see some of the kinds of activities here leading in that direction. Getting people out of their cars uh, and onto their bicycles, which means creating facilities for you to ride, uh, which means feeling like you're safe when you're on your bicycle and you're not going to get squished uh, by um, you know, an enormous amount of traffic trucks and, and so on. Uh, and that kind of thing where the design is happening in your local community uh, and you're saying actually I, I think there's an opportunity here that perhaps uh, Auckland Council, you know, downtown isn't necessarily going to notice or certainly central government's never going to notice but we notice it because we live here and looking for those opportunities and, and ways that we can say we can do just these few things. Uh, I think when you kind of go from that level of action when you collectivise that up, uh, it makes a massive difference. So our challenge uh, for this afternoon is to unpack what would a carbon neutral Mount Wasp look like. Great conversation to be having. And um, as we go, we're going to be learning about a lot more of the things that are happening locally, the organisations that are doing things, what council is doing uh, through its Live Lightning program and so on, uh, what community organisations like Ecomatters and others and Earth Action Trust are doing. So that's all. Okay, now we're going to move into having a couple of panels. So um, I'm going to invite my guests for panel one to come on stage. Why I'm here today is that A, I care about this issue. B, late last year, Olivia, who's seated down here and is helping people with the step, uh, came to my office having done a survey of people in Mount Rossville about their knowledge about climate change issues. And we entered into a conversation about what we would do. And since then, we've been able to work with some amazing people and groups in our community to put this event together. So that's why I'm here and really pleased to be part of it. Hello, my name is Brianna Fruin. I'm from the Pacific Climate Warriors. And I'm here because I'm from some of the islands that lie in the eye of the storm of climate change. And it's my calling to be here. So I'm Deb Ducko uh, from Ecomatters Environment Trust. I'm the lead researcher there. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here as uh, the climate expert, but my expertise is chiefly in um, ecology, um, although I do have some uh, climatology expertise. I'm the queen of Tuvalu. I'm too lucky to be in the royal, uh, the royal here. Anyway, and I've been living in Aotearoa, New Zealand for about 30 years now, and I'm one of the campaign lead organisers for A2. So I'm here in capacity to talk about my island, the impact of climate change on my people, and also looking at the workers' perspective, because we actually do look after co uh, workers who actually uh, work in the for sale, with for sales and things, and how we can come up with just transition, because it's their livelihoods and we care about them. Just Granada, but you can call me Granada, from Earth Action Trust. Um, I suppose I am the... Uh, representative of the migrant in the former refugee people. So as newcomers, we need to be engaged in this kind of conversation. Otherwise, we're going to be lost and left behind. And we don't want to do that. Uh, 
I am here because uh, we had our first climate change conversation in Mount Roskill back in May. So we'd like to uh, learn something from this event. And I suppose I just want to encourage everyone that it is time to take action. Well, in order for us to understand climate change, uh, really it's important to get a basis in uh, understanding what is climate. Uh, so fundamentally, I'm sure all of you are, are totally over this, but it's nice for us to have a, a bit of a recap at the beginning. So climate is fundamentally uh, the light, the water, uh, the wind, and the rainfall that exists in, in, uh, over long periods of time, the nature of a place. And um, it's, it's important uh, for humans because it basically determines what kind of life can exist. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty important the climate. <laughs> we know that the climate is changing and it's changing fast. Uh, over the past hundred years or so, we've seen more than a one degree increase in temperature across the world. We've seen um, an increasing number of um, extreme weather events, storms, droughts. Uh, James was referring to, to some of the items that are in the news lately. We know that things are changing at a rate that's much, much faster than uh, the normal rate of change within our, our global climate. And we know also that humans are causing this. We're changing um, our ecosystems. 70% of the planet has been modified by human activity. It's enormous. And most of this activity has changed diverse ecosystems to what is effectively a monoculture system. The change that's occurred over the past few years, that the awareness of what's going on and what we can each do as individuals to uh, create better communities, more thriving communities. Um, I think that that, that mobilisation is, uh, is the hope. You know, fundament, as an ecologist, what we've seen across the world is um, a change from communities that are producing to communities that are, that are more consuming. And we know that we need to revert back to those types of communities that produce goodness. Uh, the population of Tuvaluans in my beautiful island is only about 11,000 of us. And we are only about, the highest point in Tuvalu is about three and a half meters above sea level. And, uh, and as you all know, we are the face of climate change. Okay, we are the, we are the forefront of that. Why? Because the impact on climate change, the lives of my people is very important. As we can see last week at the Pacific Islands, uh, Forum leaders meeting. I, I, I really cried because, uh, what shall I say? It's about the survival of my people. We have no choice. It's about my people to survive in this world. But at the same time, we can say, because it's about our identity, because it's very important. Because even though I'm a survivor living here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, as my home now, but when people ask me, where are you from? Even though I say, I'm from Avondale, they still say, where are you from? You know, so they're referring to where I'm from in terms of my country. And so I have to tell them I'm from Tuvalu. And I'm very proud because that's my identity. Even though my people say, hey, it's about the survival of my people. The big countries will just come there. They just don't care. It's about the economy. It's about, they just don't care about the survival of my people. So when we talk about the next 10 years, we don't have to talk about the same next year. I mean, the, for the uh, next 10 years, my people are already suffering in terms of every, when there's a storm. Like what I say, my people have nowhere else to run. They don't have hills, they don't have mountains, they just sit there and just let the wind blow them away. In terms of food, they can't plant food now because road crops, because the salinity of the water, our people can't do that anymore. And so every day, our people live in fear because of that. And that's the reality that my people have to face with. So when we talk about 10 next year, for the next 10 years, no, let's talk about today. And I'm talking about our government as well. What is our government doing to help 
my people back home. And because that's the reality that my people live with every day. Okay? And then let's talk about, I'm now wearing my hat as a, a unionist. Okay? It's very, so let's talk about the reality as well, as well here in New Zealand. Yes, cold, fossil fuel, but let's talk about the workers. What can we do as well to help the workers here? Because these are human beings as well. They've got families. This is their livelihoods. So what can we do in order for them to transition, in, transition their, themselves from the work the jobs that they are doing now to uh, greener jobs, okay? The summit that we had down in Taranaki recently, the workers made it quite clear that they want to be part of this process right from the word go. They've got to be in the center of this discussion. The workers, their communities, the EUs, it's very important that we need to listen to their workers instead of the government coming and telling the, uh, the workers and saying, this is what you want you to do. No, these people need to be right in the middle of the discussion and that's where the union play a very important role because they represent the voices of these workers. And so that's where I see. So let's not talk about 10 years, let's talk about today. How can we work with that? Because I also believe, okay, part of the living, uh, I'm part of the movement that's uh, fighting for the living wage as well up there. And you know what? Yes, we don't have faith in politicians because they, they can never deliver for us. But I strongly believe in civil society, the power of broad-based community organizing. And looking around at our young people today, if we don't trust our politicians to deliver today, let's work together with our young people. And I have hope in our young people that if we continue to build civil society, the power within our community, a broad-based community organizing, we will be able to tackle climate change starting today. And I think for those of us in the political world who um, know that we have to do something about this issue, um, don't be afraid um, to do what Father did and to keep the pressure on us. Because trust me, there's pressure coming from the other direction. So to have communities building up capacity and saying we demand action is absolutely right. So I just want to acknowledge that Father. Um, the implications for our community are, are real. Um, there is, uh, you know, at the moment in New Zealand, in communities like South Dunedin, coastal inundation that is happening. Communities which are flooding several times per year and this will happen with increased frequency. Properties will become uninhabitable. That's happening now. But more broadly, the thing that comes to mind for me is something that uh, my colleague David Parker says a lot, which is that our economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. And New Zealand is an economy which to a large degree is dependent on the climate. Our ability to produce food in particular, entirely dependent on patterns of rainfall and sunshine, those things that we just heard make up our climate and those things happening in a predictable way. Go and talk to people in the rural sector at the moment about what they're experiencing with our climate and how that is affecting their ability to produce food. And that impact is happening now. And as a country that relies on that, you know, even here in the city, we don't have many cows or sheep or agricultural production here in Mount Roskill, but we are connected to that economy. Um, we are connected to the climate. People's jobs and livelihoods here, our prosperity here, is connected to what is happening in the climate. And so the implications go to our jobs, they go to our incomes, they go to the prosperity of people right here in Mount Rossville if we don't resolve this issue. Droughts and floods affect us uh, here. The implication on the flip side I want to go to is summed up in a cartoon that many of you might have seen on social media. And it's a group of people um, a bit like this sitting around in a conference hall and, they, and they're saying, what if climate change is just a big hoax and we create a cleaner and fairer world all for nothing? <laughs> and the implication for me of doing the right thing on climate change for our community is enormously positive. It'll be about people having opportunities to move around freely and easily, walking or cycling on high quality public transport. It'll be fewer respiratory diseases because we're not emit emitting carbon into the middle of our communities. It'll be healthier people, it'll be less people being harmed on our roads. If we get this right, the implications are good for our communities. We don't take action, the implications are serious. How can we lessen the harm we cause to the environment? So instead of saying, how can we adapt to the climate change, how can we adjust to the climate change? I think this can be too technical for us, from the migrant and from the perspective. So the communication needs to be very simple so that we are all included in that conversation.
Today we seem to have a competition of events, workshop, COVID, conference, and so we're driving here and there and everywhere. So are we actually lessening the harm we cause to the environment? So from my perspective, in my household, I'm the person there. Rising temperature, higher temperature, of course, is good in winter time because there's less need for heating, but it can be disadvantages on some time because now you need air conditioning and cooling system. So those are just the simple effects of uh, higher temperature. Now, let's not forget that climate change can trigger earthquakes. It can trigger tsunami, volcanic eruption, cyclone, tornado, and other disasters. Now, we ordinary people are not really prepared to handle that kind of disaster. Only the army, the navy, the police, the paramedics are actually prepared to handle what we call the unexpected. So I think from my perspective, we need to continue having this kind of conversation because we don't know how fast it's going to come or you know, how far is it going to be. So thank you for Generation Zero and the rest of the group for organizing this event. I think when we speak about the Pacific, a lot of the times we see our islands as an example of the damage that um, is happening, but I also think that our islands are an example of the resilience that's happening in this world today. I've seen young people in Tokelau build um, keyhole gardens for their villages so that their um, gardening is raised off the ground as a way of adapting to climate change and soil salination. I've seen young people in Samoa fundraise from their lunch money to build uh, solar panels for their schools. I've seen young people in Fiji travel to Thailand to learn how to build tech packs, which are community assembled uh, solar panels so that they can go and build solar panels in the villages that are affected by climate change in Fiji. And I've even seen young people from Tonga take tapa, like the one we're standing on today, all the way to Germany to block a coal mine there and unfurl this tapa that says, end fossil fuels now. I've seen so many examples of resilience that the human race could bring forward. And I think that we need more attention on that, more attention on the solutions um, and how we can move forward and how we can look at people who really should not be um, as resilient as they are because considering all the obstacles that are given to them in the Pacific, but how they've overcome that. And if someone in the Pacific could do that, anyone in the world can do that and really um, put up a fight against climate change and do something. The response we have to have to this issue needs to be a structural one, it needs to be a political one, it needs to be an economy-wide one. There are things that we can do individually but actually the, 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 the big drivers of emissions are things that we need to tackle at a higher level. So if we transform, for example, our transportation systems uh, to be uh, carbon neutral, there's huge investment there. We've got, we've got a big plan in Auckland, which is around shifting towards high quality public transport, light rail, etc. That's huge investment, which has other benefits for communities and for economic development as well. We've got commuter rail between Auckland and Hamilton about to happen which will you know, reduce the emissions that our cars use, but it's also going to be great for those communities there. If we could transform New Zealand and places like Taranaki from being an energy province based on um, the exploitation of fossil fuels to being an energy province that is based upon clean tech and clean energy, actually the, the, the economic value and the jobs that you get from that kind of investment in that industry actually tend to far outweigh the value that you actually get out of exploitation of fossil fuels. So yes, if we get this right, it's all upside. How can we connect more deeply with nature? How can we connect more deeply with each other? If we can respond to those questions in a, a really honest and meaningful way, our systems will change. Um, the, what we've seen in terms of uh, the pathway here uh, is a result of that kind of thinking, you know? How, not how quickly can we get to the city, it's how well can we experience life. Um, and yet climate change does create, because, of, because where we are now, we have some uh, system-wide changes which come down into changes that each of us really have to make in our everyday lives. And, and some of the, the most fundamental ones 
um, are of course, you know, eating less meat. meat the, the, the primary production system and the meat production system is uh, a massive one. And um, uh, yeah, yeah, a, a large uh, percentage of New Zealand's um, emissions are related to that. It's not necessarily going vegetarian, it's just treating meat in a way that we have historically. You know, as a special, as a thing for special occasions. Uh, it doesn't need to be, uh, to, to live well, we don't need to make huge sacrifices. We just need to do things uh, in a more honourable way with our ecosystems and with each other. From day one, when we started the Earth Action Trust, I've been speaking to the migrants and former refugee community about increasing their participation in waste reduction. And even waste reduction, a lot of people don't even know how to sort their rubbish. So, and in terms of climate change, I am um, 90% sure that you are, we are not that old. It seems like we need to have a research uh, to determine who are aware. And if they are aware, does it concern them? Um, and the other thing, I mean, I just I keep coming back to this facility that you've got out here. Was a, I mean, that, that was an example of communities, local government and central government agencies all working together to create that. Um, and, and other companies as well. Um, and more of that, please. Uh, and again, that was one of those things where actually it was the local knowledge um, that informed, uh, you know, piece of it that is a large infrastructure project, you know, involving tens of millions of dollars. Um, but wouldn't have been possible without that direct feedback uh, and input and the design from uh, from the local community. And as it develops, you know, there, there are so many of those kind of big high level um, things around climate change that you can just see right there. So on the one hand, you're taking cars off the road because you're encouraging people to walk or cycle. That's great, that's mitigation, you're bringing down emissions. Um, those houses along the side of it were getting flooded all of the time. Um, and now you've created a form of infra infrastructure, which is natural infrastructure, soft infrastructure, which is much better uh, at actually using the natural environment to absorb that, um, uh, those, those floods than just heavy infrastructure, concrete infrastructure was able to do. Uh, and so, you know, so that's an adaptation question uh, as well. So I, I think that there are just endless opportunities, um, but we're only going to get it right when you do have that level of coordination between the community local government and central government. But it's a transformation of ourselves alongside with the environment. You know, it's a, I find it a hard thing to articulate. I find that what we do is, um, and what we have been doing, is making changes by working alongside schools, organisations like Polyfest, a you know, huge big um, promoter of beautiful, our cultures, but it's a culture that sits up on the stage but it's not lived in the heart 